we'll check on that. Now again, Mr. Moss, the Abbey Clark County Police Department, they do have procedures for the high-risk traffic stop. Yes, sir. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Why would they have procedures for that? Why would the police department produce procedures for their for their officers to follow? Uh, that most I believe would be for the safety of the officer and the community, uh, also accountability and professionalism. You also said accountability. That's yes. That's why you do accountability. Now, okay, I want to talk to you about uh, Tony Howard, police patrol car, that red SUV. Yes, sir. Now, when you come on the scene, <coughs> did it look like Tony Howard car was parked according to the Atlanta Clark County Police Department high risk traffic stop protocol? No, sir. If you had to make that stop, would you would have parked your car like Officer Howard parked here? I may have done it a little bit differently. However, you have to also remember there's a totality of circumstances involved in this. You've got your environment that you're in. In other words, the environment, uh, the lay of the land. You also have you also have the unpredictability of where the individual that you're trying to initiate the stop on stops as well. There's a lot of circumstances involved as far as where Officer Howard's car is and where that red Suburban is, and I don't have all those facts and circumstances. Uh, to my knowledge, I don't have the ability to tell you whether or not his stop was according to our policy or not, based on the totality of circumstances at hand. Young, if, it, if I may, I would like to show Mr. Moss State Exhibit 152, sir. He's given himself plenty of distance, which is a safe distance. The only thing I may have done differently was my patrol car would have been maybe a little more to the left. But again, you have the environment to consider and also the unpredictability of where uh, the driver of this vehicle stops. Yes, sir. He needs to be able to completely respond. Okay. That is his answer. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm cutting you off, sir. That's okay. Mr. Moss, I'm going to ask you this on the I said, if Officer Tony Howe patrol car parked according to the Athens Clark County Police Department 
high risk traffic stop protocol and states is in it 151. He was answering that question and uh, was proceeding to answer that question that was already asked, so it's already been asked and answered. And he was answering that and he was cut off in the middle of it. Uh, so I'm going to allow him to finish answering the question. Yes, sir. As I was saying earlier, ideally, no. However, if you're looking at a policy that says everything is in a perfect working order, which that is not the case with life, everything can be unpredictable. That's a totality of circumstances. Um, that Our protocol and our procedure, if he's stating, is something that's there. That's what your ideal traffic stop should be like. However, the environment, the unpredictability of where the person stops their car may change that to some degree. When you agree, you, you just testified, ideally, no, that car is not parked according to the Aspen Clark County Police Department high risk traffic stop protocol. Is that what you just testified to here? Yes, sir. Would you agree that you have a, a procedure for officer safety? Yes, sir. Would you agree that the procedure is also for the safety of any members of the public who are around? Yes, sir. Would you agree that you are to follow the procedure as often as you can so that the public know you are engaged in official public business? As often as you can, yes, sir. And is it, and is it also important to follow recognized procedure when confronting high-risk suspects as I believe the carjacking suspect, is it especially important to follow those procedures to protect yourself and the public? Yes, sir. No further questions, sir. We'll put the lights back on, please. The way that we'd like to retrieve those so that we can come together. Thank you. Officer Moss, just to be clear, as far as your video in your car, is it always recording until it's activated one way or another? Yes. And when you activate it, what does, it, what does it actually save on the hard drive prior to your activation? About 30 to 45 seconds of time. Does it save more than that? No, sir. So when you were parked at the Yurpi there ordering your lunch, and before you came out and activated, it was recording at that time? Yes, sir. And when you activated it, the amount that was actually not only recorded but actually saved to the hard drive was 30 to 45 seconds prior to your activation? Yes, sir. And that is the activation of your blue lights? Yes, sir. Were you there at the time Officer Howard proceeded to get the Suburban to stop? No, sir. When you arrived in the video there, did you see the blue lights? Of Officer Howard's car on? Honestly, I don't recall. Um, I remember my focus was on more on Officer Kitchen's car and Officer Howard being on the ground, so I honestly don't recall if those lights were on or not. I would say that if they're on the video and they're on, yes, they were on. And let me go ahead and play that if I can, Judge. Play that portion of it to refresh your memory. Yes, sir.
as we're watching that, do you see Officer Kitchen's car? Yes, sir. You see the blue lights going? Yes, sir. You see any blue lights going on Officer Howard's car? No, sir. Do you know? What kind of stop? That Officer Howard made or how. My job is mainly to get out of the car and walk. Um, what you want to do is like three together with the community um, with their assistance. Just to show that men out know they're really transparent. And that's my job. How long were you in that wheat and seed program? Um, from 2005 uh, to 2011. And uh, as far as the uh, wheat and seed program, was that funded some way federally? It was a federal, federal um, grant, yes it was. And as far as during that time, were there different areas in the community that you may pay particular attention to that uh, was so your responsibility or we can see program responsibility? Uh, the areas I can recall was like Pardo area, uh, Broad Acres, Rock Spring, uh, Bill Street, Hancock. Um, then you also had the old we can see area, areas that we were responsible for, like uh, the Nineveh area or the Iron Triangle. Um, Triangle Plaza, um, Parkview, and different zones of Adams Park County. Okay. And uh, were you assigned to a particular precinct, East Precinct or West Precinct, one way or another? Um, I was assigned to the East Substation, which is located on uh, the Triangle Plaza. It's on Fairview Street. And even though you were assigned to the East Precinct, did you respond and uh, have responsibilities at times? throughout the county, east and west? Yes, sir. And tell us about that, if you will. Um, we like I said, we were just only assigned to the east precinct, but our main area was the west side of town. Um, all the facts that we patrol, Broad Acres, and the area surrounded, Rock Springs, uh, which include Baxter Street, uh, Honeysuckle Apartments, uh, also College Place Apartment, uh, Sycamore Drive, uh, Parkview area, those type areas. And in March of 2011, were there other officers who were working in that program with you? Uh, SBO Jerry Johnson and Lieutenant Patterson. And uh, Jerry Johnson, are you related to him in some way, sir? Uh, we both know. Now, in addition, during that time when you worked, uh, during shift change in particular, did you respond or have a chance to assist other shifts in any way? Yeah, at times um, when the shifts are short, uh, the supervisor would call, our supervisor would call us and, and say, hey, could y'all help us out, could we short? And we would go take control of the zone, work the zone, or we would just back someone up if need be. How about during shift change? One shift. Leaving. Service and another shift. Coming on, other folks may have been gathered at the precinct. Did y'all have responsibilities, perhaps? That was almost automatic. You know, when the shift change, you had to keep your eyes and ears open and listen to the radio. A lot of times, the dispatch will automatically call you and tell you to go catch your call until someone come on to ready. And did you and other officers at times attend briefings uh, before service? Yes, sir. Before, uh, on different shifts? Yes, sir. Yeah. And why would you do that? Well, you also want to get updates. A lot of times we don't get updates when you see them. 
So we'll go to the briefing updates and get different things like follow up them, look out for this person or that person, in and auto suspect, burglary suspect, people that have warrants on them. So we want to be updated on the information in case we come across those people. And from the time uh, you got to the department, after the Clark County Police Department in 2004 until you were assigned to Wheaton C in 05, what did you do? Uh, I was assigned to, uh, to a shift, to the chain shift. Patrol, uniform patrol? Yes, sir, west side. On the west side. Okay. Now, where are you originally from? <coughs> Athens, Clark County, here in Athens. And uh, you went to high school here? Yes, sir, I went to Clark High School, uh, graduated in 1985. Did you play any sports there? Uh, football. And are you married, sir? Yes, sir, I am. And uh, how long have you been married? I've uh, been married since 2003. And what's your wife's name? Shumi Sahal. And do you have any children at all? Yes. And how many children do you have? We have four boys. All okay. children. And uh, are any one of those, uh, you're in Shalise's uh, yes. child? Yes, it is. And uh, who is that? His name is Destin Howard. And the other three, are they yours by another marriage or her by another marriage? It is correct. I have two older kids from a previous marriage and also I have a stepson. Okay. Now, let me ask you, during this time, did you participate in any sort of a uh, program at UGA involving the athletic department, uh, involving the mentoring of athletes. Yes, sir. And uh, prior to 2011, uh, about how long had you been doing that, or do you recall about when you started doing that? Um, I think that program started since 2011, I think maybe two or three years, maybe, roughly. And were you one of the mentors? Yes, I was. Can you tell us what that involved? Um, that program mainly involved just, uh, they would hook us up with a, with a player, a freshman player, any kind of player. And we would like give him guidance. Uh, if he had any trouble academically or having any trouble on the outside, he should be able to come to us. And we should be able to you know, just talk to him come to a solution how to deal with any kind of problems before he get in trouble. Now, if he was to get in trouble on his own, that, that's on him. But we try to mentor him and steer him in the right direction. And uh, were there times that you would actually uh, meet with your mentee, the person that you were assigned, the player you were assigned? Yes, sir. And tell us about how that happened. Just meeting to talk to him, or did y'all do different activities together, or what would you do? Well, the players, we have to you know the players who may have text them. They don't like to talk on the phone too much. They have to text them. Um, sometimes you could, you could meet with them. You would have to give it to UGA staff and say, hey, I want to meet with my mentee. And they would set up and you would meet them. And did you ever uh, meet them for dinner and eat, eat dinner with them? Every so often, yes. Okay. Now, let me go back to uh, March of uh, 2011. At that time, did you know a person by the name of Jamie Donnell Hood? Uh, knew of him. And when you say you knew of him, explain that just a little bit. Um, I used to work at the Clark County Jail. Um, I just knew of him vaguely, just hearing his name. And maybe seen him once or twice, but that's it. You see, you see so many people come through the jail. You book them in, you release them, you transport them. Um, you do yard calls, uh, head count, roll call. You see so many people come through there. And do you recall uh, having any real significant or memorable contact with him at all? Not at all. Okay. Now tell me about uh, his brother, Matthew Hood. When you were involved in the Weed and Seed program, did you get to know or see Matthew Hood in some way? <clears throat> I've seen Matthew on several different occasions. Um, in the Rock Spring area. Uh, he would be walking around, no problem whatsoever. We would have conversations. Um, there have been some other times where people have... Uh, Don't go into what people may have said, but based on that, did you speak to him first? Yes, I did. Okay. And had those conversations that you had with Matthew Hood been ones that were 
generally speaking, uh, somewhat friendly or respectful in certain ways? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. And did you, uh, prior to March 22nd, 2011, did he somebody that you would recognize on site? Matthew, yes. Yes. Okay. Now, let me go back to March uh, 22nd, 2011, when you did your job. Did you do so in uniform? Yes, sir. And were you in some sort of a marked patrol car? Yes, I was. And on that day, the, the vehicle that you were assigned, did it have some sort of a video system in there? Yes, it had a digital video system. And that system itself, how would it activate uh, at that point? Um, it would activate when you press on the operate the emergency lights. Or you could operate it by pressing on it, the manual, the recording button. Manually, so we'll operate two different ways: the lights or pressing the button. And was there a video camera mounted inside your car that would uh, videotape if it was activated uh, toward the front of the vehicle and what you see in front of your vehicle? There was a video camera mounted on the uh, rearview mirror. On the rearview mirror, right. facing out the windshield. I see. Okay. Now. Let me go back to March 22nd, 2011. On that day, were you working in the Weed and Seed program? Yes, sir, I was. Did you actually work that day? Yes, sir. What was your shift on that particular day, sir? When did you come off? Eight o'clock that morning. And I meant to ask you this. Let me back up. When was your shift went from 8 o'clock to when? 4 o'clock. Okay. And Jerry Johnson, Officer Jerry Johnson, did he work the same shift or a different sort of shift? Well, sometimes he would come in the same time I would, 8 to 4, or sometimes uh, the lieutenant would have him come in at a later time, uh, 10 o'clock or 12 o'clock or 2 o'clock. And I meant to ask you, how are you and uh, Jerry Johnson related as brother-in-law? Uh, we're married to two sisters. Okay. So your wife, Sherlisa, uh, is a sister of his wife. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Now, on that day, you came on and were working an eight to four shift. Can you tell me, basically, around one o'clock or so, did you hear any kind of call go out about some sort of a, a kidnapping or so on the east side? Um, there was a call come on the radio by dispatch. Uh, so, both of them um, normally they do a bolo, they do an east side and west side. Um, and they also said they wanted to call for Jane Hood. So I was already on the west side. So what I did at that time was put on a car computer my MDT. What is MDT? Um, it's the car computer which gives us IDs. Um, also dispatch can send us call on the computer. Um, we can also look at uh, mapping information. Uh, we can write reports. We can do all that on MDT. Um, so what I did, I typed his name in on IDs to see who Jane Hood was. Um, I had an idea, didn't really know, so I put it on, on IDs and his picture about it. So I did that to see who I was looking for, who they said would be on the lookout for. And basically following that, did you have some sort of an area that you may be looking at? Um, they advised to be in it, be on the lookout area of Sycamore Drive, Cascade, apartment complex in that area. And so after retrieving that information, either from your MDT, your, your computer, in your car, or uh, from dispatch or both, what did you do? Um, at that time, I went toward that area and just um, riding around so you could uh, see him you know, in the area. And when you say you're riding around, did you go down Sycamore from Broad or did you get to Sycamore some other way? Uh, from Broad Street. And as you went down Sycamore, can you tell us basically what you did, whether you saw any other officers or, or what did you recall? <clears throat> uh, there was a number of officers in the area, combing the area, just like I was just looking for him. Um, I cannot tell you how many officers it was, but it was a lot of officers. And we're just riding down through apartment complexes, uh, Cascade, Timber, eight, timber, I think timber apartment, 
Timber Chase. Timber Chase. Uh, River's Edge. Uh, we just riding there looking, at, looking for him. And uh, at that time that you were riding through, did you, or you already know, officers alert you that they saw uh, the defendant, Jamie Hood? No, at that time we didn't see him for, I think that went over maybe 15 minutes, maybe. Uh, since we didn't find him, it was already close to shift change. Um, we all went 10 8 go ahead and service. So we kind of figured he wasn't in the area when we all left. And where did you go? I left the area myself. Um, I went back up Broad Street in the area of um, the Omni Club. And as you come out Sycamore on to Broad Street and heading back toward Alps Hawthorne intersection there, the, uh, the Omni Club, is that a fitness center? It is. It used to be the old Kroger's shopping center. And is it on the right, not too far from the intersection of Sycamore and West Broad? It's on the right hand side of the red light. And did you go down into that area? Yes, I did. And uh, what happened as you were down in that area of that parking for the Omni Club? Um, or Omni uh, Club? I just went down there and just sat there for a few minutes. I got a call. And, um, and in dispatch, they gave me a private call. And a private call is when dispatch contact you personally. No one else can hear the call. And they advised me to go back down to the area and look for a Catholic, a brown Catholic. Uh, I guess they did that because it was close to ship change. They didn't want to get anybody else involved. Uh, so I went back into that area. And uh, uh, when you did that, you got back on the broad and then turned left on the sycamore and went down in there? That's correct. And at this time, sir, tell us what happened as you went through there. <clears throat> Who did you see? Um, what happened as best you can recall at this point? When I left the area and went got on Broad Street, Turned up on the Sycamore, went down through there, and I saw Jerry Johnson, S. Bill Jerry Johnson. And um, I told the dispatcher, give me a call, look for this Cadillac, the round Cadillac. So at that time, I told him, I said, well, if you turn in the Cascade here to your right, I'll go down Sycamore, and we'll meet at the end. Um, at that time, I observed a, it was a red SUV coming out of Rivers Edge apartment. It was turning left onto Sycamore. As I was passing, I looked up and I saw Matthew Hood. Um, I don't remember how I told him to stop. I don't know if I just motioned to him or yelled out of one door to say stop. And he talked to him. Did you he, see anybody else in the car at that time? Not at that time. I didn't. <coughs> and my reason was speak with him, see if I can get information on the whereabouts of James Hood. Um, it wasn't a traffic stop. Um, it was mainly just a casual stop. Just like if I was walking in the community, if I want to do a police citizen encounter, I would just talk to somebody, see that can I talk to you for a minute? That's all it was. Um, and after directing him in one way um, to stop, what happened? As I was passing, he stopped. I went down and turned around, or well, trying to turn around. I pulled into the Cascade driveway. And at that time, I received a call from Sergeant Epps at the time. And I picked up the phone. I remember asking him, and he wanted to talk about the Cadillac. And I told him I couldn't talk, I'm talk. I'm stopping the vehicle. So as I put the phone down, and I finna get him to call out until I sent him where I was at. And at that time, fixing to do what? Call out to dispatch. On your radio? On my radio, to let them know I'm making a stop. Just let them know where I'm at. Um, like I said, it wasn't a traffic stop. Um, and at that time, I observed a suspect to jump out the passenger side of the SUV. And then me and I recognized him as Jamie Hood. Um, you recognized him from the picture you pulled up or from some other tape? tape? From that picture, I had just pulled it up on the MDT. Um, at that time, so he was not running away, he was running towards me. He was running or walking? He was running towards me, running towards me. So I'm in my vehicle trying to get out the seat belt and talk to my radio at the same time. But at that time, he was, it happened so quick, he was at my driver's side door. And at that time, I reached out to Jamie and I said, stop. 
Well, I thought I had a good enough grip on him, but he broke the grip and he kept running back toward the end of the vehicle, which I thought. Because at that time, that's when I'm turning to see which way he went. And which way did you turn for the jury and for the record? Over your which shoulder? I turned on my right shoulder to see which way he went. I didn't see him. And it's just an instant, I felt a sharp pain to the left side of my face, which I thought he had struck me with his fist. And, and then what happened? And then seconds after that, I heard a gunshot. Um, and that time, I'm trying to get out of the vehicle. And when I get out of the vehicle, um, I remember falling to the ground. And I know I said a quick prayer real quick because I just didn't know what was going on. And I remember saying, Lord, you said, no weapons formed against you shall prosper. I'm sorry? No weapons formed against you shall prosper. I remember saying that. Um, I remember that I couldn't breathe out of my nose. I only could breathe through my mouth. And I heard Jerry Johnson come up and said, Tony, stay down, stay down. Don't get up. That's the base of what I Do you recall hearing any other shots after you heard, got, felt the sharp pain to your face, and then heard a shot? I only recall thinking of one shot at the time. You don't recall hearing any other shot? No. And when Jerry Johnson uh, came up to you and told you to stay down, what else do you recall at that point? If anything. Uh, I believe being in the CAT scan. Um, why I remember it, I don't know. Uh, I remember the doctor was talking on his re recording inside the room where they put you through the CAT scan. And for some reason, I remember this. He was saying I have one trauma victim. And I raised up and said, who been trauma? And the nurse said, that's what I said. I, I don't recall that, but that's what I said. Um, that's all. Going back as best you can remember, sir, when you were proceeding to Radio Inn, you said you saw a person get out of the passenger side of that SUV. Is that correct? Yes, sir. At what point did you actually recognize that being Jamie Hood, and where was Jamie Hood at the point in relation to your two cars? I recognized him when he was in the, the front of my vehicle, between my vehicle and the SUV. I mean, that's how quick it was. Um, he was not, like I said, he was not running away from me. He was running towards me. And when he was running, did you see basically how he ran in relation to your driver's uh, door and window? He ran from the front of my vehicle around to my driver's door. And that's when I grabbed him. Was your window down? My window was down. And did you reach out with both hands to grab him? Yes, I did. You call actually grabbing him yes. momentarily? Yes, I was going to grab him. And he was able to break free? Yes. And after doing that, could you tell at that time which direction he was going, or did you believe he was going? I believe he was going back toward my vehicle, running away. Toward the back of your vehicle? Yes, which I thought. And is that why you turned from your left over your right hand shoulder? To see which direction he was going. And as you were turned, is that when you felt the pain to the left side of your face? I felt the pain as I was coming back. That's when I felt the pain. So you turned and started coming back, and that's when you felt the pain? Yes, sir. And, sir, what injuries did you sustain on that day? Um, I was shot in the face. Um, 
I don't know if you all can see them. It's an indentured right hand place. Um, and the bullet exited on this side of the place. Um, I was also shot in the back. Um, the bullet, it went up under my vest and exited here. Your Honor, may the witness step down and demonstrate and show more closely to the jury exactly the spot that he was shot, right. that indentation, and the exit. <coughs> show the jury, first of all, on the left side of your face where you were, uh, where the indentation is that indicates the entrance one. Show these up here. Now turn and show the exit wound, if you will, of the location. And about where were you shot in the back, sir? Do you can you demonstrate that? Um, it went under my vest. Just behind your left shoulder at the top there? That's correct. And about where did it uh, go from there? It came out here. Hold on, y'all see that one. Thank you, sir. Can you take the stand with the honor permission? Sir, if you will, can you tell us those injuries that you sustained, are there any sort of residual effects that you still uh, feel and notice at this point? At times, um, I lost 25 to 30 percent of my hearing. Of your hearing? Of my hearing, because um, it's the sound busted my eardrum. Uh, at times when I have headaches, Sometimes it feels just like I just got shot. Um, and my back is still, is still tender when someone touch it. About how long were you in the hospital, do you know? <clears throat> it was from, the incident happened March 27th, which is a Tuesday. And I believe I got out on that Monday afternoon. The next Monday? The next Monday, yes sir. And you were not able to go back to work until October of 2011? That is correct. And from that time you moved into a different assignment? Which is pre employment back in investigation. Which is what you're doing now? Yes, sir. And also, sir, uh, Howard, the person you've uh, talked about is Jamie Hood. Do you see him in the courtroom here today? Yes, sir. Would you point him out and, if you will? He's a gentleman sitting at the desk, the black jacket, blue shirt, and tie. And that's the man that shot you on that day? Yes, sir. May the record reflect that he has pointed to and described and identified Jamie Donnell Hood. The record will report the witness is identified the defendant. And sir, at that time, did you pull your handgun at all anyway? Didn't have time. And at that time, do you were there's my house right there. Thank you, sir. That's all I have. Morning, Mr. Howard. Morning. How long have you been law enforcement, Mr. Howard? Twenty-two years. What year did you start, Mr. Howard? Nineteen ninety-three. Go 
on your time in law enforcement, have you been suspended for giving yeah. a false statement in your administration to the investigation? I would object uh, as uh, and ask the matter to be taken up outside of the presence of the jury. If I may. Ask the jury to go to the jury room. to some sort of fishing expedition as far as cross-examination to ask questions. First of all, we'd be doing that is not proper. We've not been provided any information whatsoever that uh, Officer Howard was ever suspended. And he was basically asking, have you ever been suspended for providing false information or false report or false statements and all anything like that? And that is not the proper way to do any of this uh, whatsoever. We've not gotten any anything in discovery about anything like this whatsoever. Yeah, Judge, I got Mr. Howard's record where he was suspended at. He was suspended for giving false, <coughs> making false statements during the administrative investigation. And he was also had to have counsel for threatening to hit some officer in the head. He said, it's on April 20, 2011, Deputy Lindsay gave Corporate Howard the thing that said, fuck you. Corporate Howard told Deputy Lindsay, you might be going to whoop my ass, I'm going to whoop your ass. Because I'm not going to talk about I would you. object to him. Oh, 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 he oh, wants oh, to oh, provide oh, that oh, 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 with you. I would respectfully object to him sure. doing that and saying that. That is not being asked. Let me ask this question. Did you provide that to the state for the simple show? It was in on Boston that you sent me when I first started representing myself. I had, again, I, I, I'm locked in a jail cell already. I can't get this stuff. I don't see why he want to hide the truth for. Your Honor, I would object to his comments to this, to me, to continue to do that. Sure, he's doing. addressing Stop. this. Stop. Stop. Addressing me. Stop. Mr. Hood, you're talking to me. Yes, sir. Only. Yes, sir. And I'm going to ask Mr. Malden not to interrupt. Talk to me. How did you perceive that evidence? When you allowed me to represent myself, you instructed them to bring all the boxes that they hate. I got maybe almost four, five thousand just say apartments. So you're saying you got it from the state? Is that correct? In no boxes, they come by the scope. You want me to look at what you have? Yes, sir. I'm going to let Mr. Mullen respond. I won't ask you to not say anything until I look back at you, which I just did. Yes, I'm swaying. Yes, sir. We've not been provided this at all. The boxes he's talking about are boxes that may have come from the Capitol Defender's Office, not from us. 
we basically got what we served, and we've never had these documents. I don't know what they are, have not reviewed them, have not seen them before. They were not provided to him, and his idea that somehow they, uh, he just figured that they came from us is incorrect in that regard, because they never did, nor did he provide. He didn't provide us any discovery until June the 8th. 2015, a week after jury started, jury selection started. And this was not in any of that whatsoever uh, at all. This was not provided. We haven't reviewed it. We haven't gone through this. And in addition, this is not in any way any sort of proper way to do any of this matter. It has not been provided at all. My question to you, have you, did you provide it to the state or was it simply part of this box that you received, is that, is that well, the case? This, this is what happened. On my reciprocal discovery, he told me about it in the first place. I done that, and I told him I'm using what the state provided me. So my discovery come from them. All these videos I got that he got, that's why I know it's on those tapes, because they the one gave them to me. So my thing is this here. Up under the greater rule, he's supposed to thoroughly investigate this whole entire case. Officer Howard is involved in this case. He the one supposed to be checking off the Howard whole record because and that's that just natural up under up under the brain. I'm not even a lawyer, and I'm and I'm telling him his duty. He 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 knows about it. He the district attorney. He's supposed to thoroughly investigate this officer. In these instances that you want to question him about or regarding matters that happened in 2000 and 2002, is that correct? Yeah, but I got some case law on that about lap of time. It don't matter what time. I'm just asking if that's, if that's what it was. I, want, I, I don't know what day it is. All I knew would come out in record. He was suspended, <coughs> and he had to go to counsel. And, and, and I'm entitled to a thorough sifting cross-examination. The Constitution allowed me that. Now, we are here for the truth. Mr. Marlon Siebert, old representative, I don't know why he see him and talking about don't say that about him. Why? How that was really going on? If I'm mad enough to come here and face what I'm facing, everybody else is going to be mad enough too. So he looked at him, he see what it said. The man was suspended. And I have a right to ask him about it because I did get it out of no boxes. We hear what the truth. He can explain what he done done. He's a grown man. Was there a pleading that referenced this incident filed by the defendant? I'm trying to recall. I don't know what, what you may be referring to. I certainly don't recall that, Judge. Well, give me a moment. <clears throat> you know, so give me a moment.
Under 608, I'm going to allow Mr. Hood to ask the question regarding whether or not he was disciplined. And I cannot, I, depending on the answer, I, I can't address the other thought on what the answer is. Judge, we have not been served with a copy of this under discovery. We were never served with that at all. We weren't provided that or given notice that anything was going to be used. In fact, I thought the procedure, if somebody moves into anybody's personnel file, generally that would be submitted before it's turned over to anybody, and there'd be perhaps an in-camera inspection where the court could determine. There are two different documents here as you're doing it. One of them talks about a Deputy Lindsay and what Deputy Lindsay may have said to Deputy Howard. What Deputy Lindsay may have said to Tony Howard. And basically, with Tony Howard being a supervisor, talking about basically, in fact, it says, a counseling statement is not to be considered a disciplinary action, but may be used as a basis to support it in the future, such action. But it basically talks about a Deputy Lindsay and basically indicating that Officer Howard, about his response as a supervisor, and how none of this is relevant whatsoever in this regard. But there's two different matters as you're dealing with that, as you're working through that. And I would respect the objective. We've never been served with that. We've never given notice of this. He, regardless of whether he represents himself, still has to abide by the discovery rules. We insisted on that. He was supposed to have done that within 10 days after we complied with discovery, which we have done repeatedly over the years. And most certainly, we brought it up on the first day of jury selection, is we had never gotten anything. We actually brought it up on May 27th. Where's the discovery? Your Honor directed him to go ahead and comply, which he did not do. We didn't get anything until after the trial started on June the 8th. This is not in here. Yes, sir. Again, I'm going to allow Mr. Hood to ask the question. Look, Mr. Hood, watch me. The question of this witness as to whether or not he has been disciplined. That's as far as I would go. Yes, I wouldn't write something to your attention. He just misled you. He didn't tell you what Tony Howard just said, and I didn't get finished. And I need to be heard on this because the prosecutor just misled you. And I want to read you what Tony Howard said. I read both documents. Okay, you don't read it. I read both documents. So do you understand my direction? Yeah, I hear you, but I'm still kind of lost because... Well, let me say it again, and I think this will clear it up. The question I'm going to allow you to ask is, have you been the subject of any disciplinary actions? That is going to be it. You're not going to ask anything else regarding that. Well, I've got case law on that. I'd like to bring it up. That is my ruling. So I can't read my case law? No, sir. I'm not. I'll let you make that point later. Okay, well, I have on my witness list. I'll recall them if I have to. All right. So what you said, have you ever been what? Subject to any... Disciplinary action. I'm not saying you have to ask those words. Okay. Well, how about the words of spending? Disciplinary actions concerning false statements. Okay. Have you ever been... What words you say? I want to use your case law. Disciplinary actions concerning false statements. All right. And then you'll move on to another line. Okay. All right. So I can't say nothing about it. So you're telling me... Because this... You can cite your case if you want. I'll let you cite your case now. Yeah, okay. I'd like to cite that case just for the record. Okay.
there, I would like to cite State versus Hodges, 291 Georgia, 413, 2012. The Supreme Court of Georgia. Just cite, you just cited it. Okay. I'll be looking at it. 291 Georgia, what? Uh, 291 Georgia, 413, 2012. Any others? Okay.
Started there in 1993. I see people come and I see people go. I said, me. I don't recall you. Like I said again, vaguely. When you say you don't vague, you got me lost. Did you see me? Yes or no? I don't recall seeing you. I could have, I could not. Why did you testify earlier that you recall seeing me vaguely? If you saw me vaguely, that means you saw me, Mr. Howard. Is that correct? Can I answer? Yes, sir. Do you know what vaguely means? Do tell it, it's broad. It's real broad. I see a lot of people come. I see a lot of people go. I have some. I have people came up to me and say, "Didn't you see me when I come through there?" I said, "I don't remember." You could have. I could have talked to you. I don't know. I just don't remember. Man, I don't, Mr. Howard. Right, 
Miss Ivy stated she worked for Weed and Seed. Could you tell us again about that program, sir? Well, it's a program that was federal grant funded. And what we basically do going to communities, going to areas, and we weed out criminal activity. What we basically need to be doing is being highly visible. And the seating part is we come in and revitalize the neighborhood. We might paint the apartment, help pick up trash, uh, cut trees down. Um, it's a program also what we call uh, SEPTAKE, uh, which is uh, community protection through environment design. Howard, you stated that you worked at high crime areas in Weed C, correct, sir? Yes. Okay. You stated that you worked in a project called Poldo, correct, sir? Yes. Tell us about your work in Poldo. Uh, mainly what I do, I park my car in Poldo, and I get out and walk in the community. And what I would do, uh, what we call like bridging the gap with the police in the community. So that the people see me be visible. If anything that's criminal activity in the area, hopefully they'll see me, they'll move on out. If not, I address the issue, whatever the issue might be. Are you familiar with the drug dealers in Athens, Georgia? No, I don't know. No. Well, you agree we can see there's a drug program also, sir? Uh, not necessarily. You could say that, but not do a lot of other different things. You know when the drug dealers are called, Mr. Howard. I've been out the loop so long, I don't know anybody anymore. Mr. Howard, do you know any drug dealers from Paul? He answered the question, Jack. Thank you, Jack. Fair enough. Do you know Mr. Jadon Broke, Mr. Howard? I know when I see him. Tell us about what you know about Mr. Jadon Broke, Mr. Howard. Uh, I want to say maybe a month ago I saw him in the Army Club. And he came over and introduced himself to me. Friday, March 22nd, 2011, did you know Mr. Jadon Brook, Mr. Howard? I, I heard of him, heard the name around. So you never seen him in person? I could have, don't know. I could have. What do you remember, Mr. Howard? I saw him in the Army Club. And he came up to me and told me who he was. Why would you want to introduce yourself to you? I have speculation on your part about what Mr. Brooks may have made society public. You say you did work Paul though. Are you familiar with Jadon Brooks selling any drugs by Paul though? I just he just came up to me and introduced himself to me about a month ago. How about Mr. Kenyatta County? Do you know him to sell drugs in the area of Paul? I've heard. You heard. Tell us what you heard about that drug dealer. Yeah. All that hearsay, right? They shouldn't be hearsay. That's the same. Okay. But you did hear about Mr. Kenyatta County selling drugs in Paul? Street talk. But you heard it though. Right? Street talk. But did you hear? Next question, Judge. Yes, sir. So when a police officer hears street talk, don't they, don't they, that's why the police go and investigate and catch people because they hear street talk and they go find out what's going on. Well, you we hear people talk. We hear things all the time. Some of the stuff is not true. Some of the stuff is true. But you don't go investigate, correct, sir? You don't, per se, go immediately investigate. You would just take that and, and go with it. If you see something going on in the neighborhood or area, you would you will work on it. You would deal with it. If not, you just pass the information on to the drug unit. After you heard the hearsay about Mr. Kenyatta Campbell setting the road, did you go investigate that? No. Why not? Because I didn't know him that good. I didn't know him like that. So is it so you got to know a person before you go investigate somebody about some drugs? Is you tell them No, 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 no. You, you, you misunderstand. If someone comes to me and say, James Hood over there selling dope, I say, okay. And then if I come across James Hood, and if I see Jamie Hood doing something suspicious or out of ordinary, I would talk to him and investigate myself. So before you go investigate, you got to have a name on it. I would like to have a name. 
where well, law for a minute, but you, it do it matter if you got a name, you don't know the person, they're doing something wrong, ain't that your job to go get them? Yep, I need to know the name, where I'm going. So when you pull something out over the car, riding down for a speed thing or something, you got to know the name when you pull them over? No, I'm not going to, uh-uh. Well, what's the difference between I'm trying to figure out where you're going with this. That is absolutely inappropriate and argumentative, and there's absolutely no basis for any of that for him to ask a question like that. No objection is sustained. Well, I'm trying to figure out, Judge, he'd have heard him say that don't be going to go investigate, but I'm going to watch. Your Honor, that is not a question, and I would object to Mr. Hood basically making comments like that. Ask the question. Mr. House, you said you don't need to see you, right? Yeah. You know when the feds in town or when they're going to do a drug, but well, you don't. No, unless they contact me. But is it? Or, or maybe a supervisor or, or another officer come, come to me and say, hey, so and so in town, we need you to go help out. That's the only way I would know. I just want to know. But if somebody come, have, have, have anybody ever come to you? and told you that the feds or somebody in town, they, they grab enough drug bill and you participate, how they ever have on you see? I would object to all of that being irrelevant to the issues in this particular trial and what happened in March of 2011. And I would object to that. Judge, it's relevant. He the one brought up weed to see, but wasn't me. That when he sat there and asked him, and I'm tired of him crying about the action. Your Honor, I would object and ask him better. Take up outside the presence of this jury. I can hear without shout. Yes. Is that clear? Yes. I'll ask the jury to go to your Just 
logical, relevant question. We here for the truth, ain't we? What do you keep? What, 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 what do you probably keep John Robin Lawler? Yes, sir. Okay. I'm going to let Mr. Malden respond, and I'm going to ask you to not say anything. Yes, sir. Respond. Yes, sir. Yes, he did with you. Judge, there are rules concerning hearsay. There's rules concerning relevance. We asked him about what area he was, what area he was in and working through. We can see generally what that does, and not open the door to come in and talk about everything that he may have done from the period he was, began in Weedon C until which time this event happened in March of 2011. And that's what's irrelevant when he starts talking about you're familiar with federal investigation, you're familiar with this, and you're familiar with that, and start talking about all of that. It may go on, had nothing to do with what happened on March 22nd, 2011, whatsoever. Where he may want to go or thinks he may want to go, I have no idea. But it's not a fishing expedition simply because he indicated he worked with Wheat and Seed for a period of time. Young, I'm not on no fishing. This would explain to the jury why he didn't get on their radio. This would explain why their camera ain't on. See, I know some stuff that don't nobody else know. And me and Tony Howard know it. See, that's why I'm hitting that. What made Jamie do that? Why, Ty, why, why Tony Howard didn't follow the protocol? I've been saying the same thing almost four and a half years. But everybody trying to stick a needle in my arm and draw me up. This case wasn't been over two and a half years ago. I'm sitting here and told them what happened. And judge, it's, it's all about my state of mind. Why in the world, Jamie, who is shooting the back on police? Something wrong. And it just wasn't Jamie. I done told you my part. And it's a daggone shame they trying to hide data. All right. Here's where we're going. This is what we're going to do. We're not going to have these shouting matches. Yes, sir. With me or anyone else. When the state makes an objection, you're going to stop. When I rule, and I'll give you a chance to respond to the objection, when I rule, you move on and ask the question. If I sustain, ask another question, if I sustain it, they, they'll be instructed to, uh, if I overrule the objection, they're going to be instructed to answer. And then we're going to move on. And we're not going to have this issue coming back forth. I don't know what you're going to ask. So I can't sit here and predict what I'm going to do until, until it is asked. Yes, sir. But I will tell you this. Irrelevant questions, that is a valid objection. Ask and answer questions is a valid objection. Asking the same question a different way is asking the same question. So, and I just need to make this statement. Asking the same question in successive times in hopes of getting another answer is not what we do. So, if they answer it, but you may not like the answer. Mr. Malden might not like it. You have to ask another question, not the same one. I think I'm just trying to, trying to lay it out. Yeah. I think I've been pretty fair when you tell me to move on. That's See, right. Judge, you ain't the one stopping me. See, when I go talk about certain things, he jumping up out of relevant. He can't say it's irrelevant. The judge, like you say, you don't even know what I'm going to well, say. He has to, here, here's the thing. I really would prefer not to have talking objections. I would, unless I need information, I'll ask for it. If the objection is relevant, and this works both sides. Make that objection. Oh. Uh, if it's something else, if it's hearsay, it's just, that's all that needs to be said. That's, that's, that's perfect. If, 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 right. if I say something, he, 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 you know, like you said, just do it the right way. Just don't say nothing. And that's it. I'm gonna do better on my behalf. But as you know, I've got to, I've got yes, to address. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Any questions? That's it. All right. We're ready to bring the witness in, and Jerry. All right. Ask the witness to come back in.
Citizen that I see in the Ross Grant area or any other area, I, I go up on and talk to them. But you know him personally. I know him by name. I know that you gave a live, you gave an interview on March 22nd to a, a GBI agent named Rebecca Shaw. That's right, sir. That's right. A live interview. I was told I did, but I don't personally remember that. Okay. You were told you did. When they told you you had an interview, did you? I got you a question. Okay. Did you review the interview that you had with Rebecca Shaw after whoever told you that you had the interview? I did that, yes. So you do recall listening at the interview with him? Yes. I was in the hospital, and at certain points and times and days, you have to have a, a written report or whatever submitted. But I was in the hospital. So after you returned to sir, you didn't have a prosecutor here or the chief of police that asked you, hey, could you give us a report? What happened that day? No. Because I believe the uh, someone came and talked to me while I was in the hospital. I just can't remember. Athens Park County Police Department. East side or west side? I was at Eden C. I was at East and West. You were East and West. Were you working day shift or night shift? Day shift. What time did your shift start and end on March 22nd, 2011? 8 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Who was your shift supervisor on March 22nd, 2011? It was Lieutenant Patterson. Did that patrol car have standard radio traffic equipment in it? 
we all have radios on our shoulders. I have an MDT. I have my camera docket. Excuse me, my camera docket. Um, I can't remember. No, well, we didn't. We didn't have that in my car. No. I'm trying. I'm trying to remember on my on my radio, on my car. Um, I just don't remember my. I just don't remember. Take off at home. Like I said, I don't remember my car. My car, it's been so long, we all use these portable radio phones. So you don't use police, the, the, the patrol car don't have radio, you just don't they, use They do, some of them do, some of them don't. Standard, but it had an audio and video camera. Well, that audio and video camera, camera working properly when you got it in the car that day on March 25, 2011. Yes. Is it normal practice for you to inspect your police patrol car for equipment failure? Yes. What are the procedures if you find any equipment failure on your patrol car? You document it and you take it to a um, fleet. Particular call dispatch just advise um, all the units on the lookout, and that's how we all became involved. What time was it when you heard the alleged carjacking call? Uh, I don't know. Uh, one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock. I believe it between one and one thirty. I think.
project and um, and it's gonna be uh, it'll be a check. Okay. What was the location when you first heard the Red Project was called? Um, don't remember that was it. I think it's on like Wall Street, but I'm, I'm not for sure exactly that was it. Dispatch had been looked out for to Jamie Hooley. Um, I don't recall any other names at this time. Did you hear Jadon Brooks' name? No, I don't. I don't think so. I don't think so. They, they could have said. I just don't recall. She'll change. They, they don't want to inconvenient anybody. And they would give me a call. Or they, they do that a lot. And so that's, this, that's a courtesy thing. They just give me a private call and say, hey, we're going to Cascade, Sycamore Drive.
tell us why did this have to do with you? God, all that for us. Now, Lord God, go on this trip, Lord God, by yourself. Can I ask you? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, No, I did not, because when I left, when I went down towards the area, I was sitting on Cascade, that's when I saw his coach, Jerry Johnson. And that's when I had came up with Cal. What you said, you had went to the Army and you saw it sitting in the parking lot. I'm curious, sir, let me back it up. First you said, if I recall correctly, you and several other officers were on Sigma Drive, about 15 minutes, minutes looking for me in that Cadillac. Y'all didn't find me, so you said you wanted to park in the Army. Is that correct? You parked that's in the Army? shift change. So I just happened to work in the area and just to see it. And because we just had left the area. They just gave me a private car on just off the, off the radio. They were told to go down there. So I communicated with dispatch in a private car. So, yeah, it was private. It was so private. Y'all didn't want the rest of the office to know that you were going over there to sit and look for me. It, it, it wasn't like that. Well, what was it then? It wasn't like that at all. It was, they gave me a private car. They like, I want to give you a car. I want to do a cell phone. Hey, I want you to go down and check the area. And just how did shift change? Shift change. They was already going in. But you didn't let the, but you didn't let the one, the one who was still on. You didn't let them know. Did they you? was already in then. Right, but you didn't let nobody, the other know, did you? No.
I think I saw him the first time. When we took the first time. You think you did? You did? I'm sure I'm sure he was in the area. Tell us what well, I'm going to get. What did you see off the I'm going to get his car. What, what did you see his car at? He was riding around the area. Was it stopped in the road or was it moving? Um, he was moving. So it wasn't just stopped in the road? No, um, we'll go right around looking for you. Okay, well, Officer Chris is sitting parked in the road waiting on Silk Tank to chain talk on a cell phone to somebody. I, I don't know that part. But you do remember that car was moving that just went sitting there with That was the first time. The time we were lying when they were riding looking for you. Okay, how about when you came from the army the second time? Did you see Officer Chris sitting there in that road? No, sir, I didn't. Did you see Officer Jerry Lester Johnson on Sycamore Drive, sir? Jerry Johnson, yes, sir. Jerry Johnson, your brother-in-law, is that correct? That's correct. What did you and Jerry Johnson talk about on Sycamore Drive? Um, I told him to go around, take a ride, and go down Cascade and look for the Cadillac. The brown Cadillac. Your Honor, I, I 
think I'm going to have to use a little elbow, a couple of uh, states as it to pull up that old screen on Sycamore Drive so me and him can talk about what we saw. What are the numbers that we know? Um, That'd be exhibit number 10, sir. Uh, exhibit number 145, exhibit number 149, exhibit number 150, exhibit number 151, exhibit number 152. All right. Name those again. I thought you were asking for one. I'm sorry, sir. It's exhibit number 10, number 145, 149, 150. 151 and 152. I wrote down those numbers, Ms. Davis, if that would be helpful to you. Start with one of them, or do you need them all at the same time? She can just give me ten, so she can get a okay. with it. This it? Yes, sir. I did. Okay. That's correct. Okay, we're going down Sycamore Drive, right? That's correct. Now, could you tell us, what, what I'd like you to do is take this little thing here, the little laser, and I'd like you to demonstrate how you come down on Sycamore Drive, what you're doing. Can you do that for us, please, sir? Yeah.
since you focused on the area of unity, did you come in the first entrance or the second entrance? So mm -hmm. where the first entrance at? First entrance is Cascade right here. Yes, sir. And this is also the second entrance. Okay. When you, when did you go in the first entrance or the second entrance? The first time I, I, I don't remember, I couldn't have came in on this first one. I couldn't have. I'm sorry, sir. You said you don't remember? You I, don't I said I couldn't have, I couldn't have came in this way. First time. Well, I could have came in this way. Well, we was coming that whole area right here. So you don't know if you come in the first or the second? Mm -hmm. Now you said uh, you saw Officer Ring. Tell me if you saw Officer Ring yet. Could you please do that? Uh, when you asked me, I said I couldn't have. That's what it said. I said I couldn't have. But I could have. I could have talked to him right here on Sycamore. I could have talked to him right here. I don't recall what I saw the ring yet. But we just had a death on Brownie's apartment complex. Okay, but you can't tell us what you talked to him. No, no. How, how, did you when you saw him when you were caught parked? Did you stop and talk to him? More than likely, by talking to him, we stopped side by side. When well, y'all stopped this show? When we stopped, we probably didn't stop right here. We could have stopped in there somewhere. So you don't know if you was on the main street or in that apartment complex? No, I, I can't. I don't remember right now, sir. Okay, but you didn't come in the first time that you was on the street right? I believe he was. So what he was? Uh, I said, I believe he was. Okay. You stayed at Officer Christian, or show up where Officer Christian was over there. Show up where he was. No, there was, was a lot of officers over there, just coming in the whole area. I just saw cars. I'm trying to remember what his car name means now. Yeah. I, I do remember seeing him. I know you, you testified that you saw him. You saw yeah. that driving. Show up where he was driving at all the area. Show up Officer Christian. We was all over this whole area. Up and down Sycamore Drive, Cascade, Timber Chase, all over and through there. Now, Everybody was just driving. And that, that was the first time. First time. Now, show us when you left Sycamore Drive and go to the other show what you did and how you done that. Uh, went up Sycamore Drive, went up to Broad Street, and took a right. Okay. Now, how long did you stay in the Omni apartment, I mean, the, the Omni parking lot, before you went back to Sycamore Drive the second time? It wasn't long at all. I'm not sure how long it was, how many minutes. Five minutes, 10 minutes, 15? I'm not sure. But I do know it was right, pretty close to shift change. And what time shift change, sir? 145. 145. Sometimes officers leave out and head out earlier to um, shift change because they had to swap vehicles out. <clears throat> When you left there on the clock, like you go back to Sycamore Drive on this private call, and when you didn't call nobody, I'm sure how you got back to Sycamore Drive and what you saw. Uh, I was on Broad Street, took a left on Sycamore Drive, and now Sycamore Drive. I think I started riding here somewhere when I saw SPO Jerry Johnson. You said you, so that the first right. entrance right now? Yeah. So you, you stopped right there at that first entrance? Uh-huh. Right, right in there. Because then he took a right and came on in here. So he, he took a right and came on in now? In Case K, yes. So you didn't take that right? You didn't go that way? I came straight down. You came, are you certain you came straight down the night? Uh, I came the second time. So you came the second time? Show, show us with that laser, how did you, specifically how you came after that second time? Come down to Sycamore Drive. Okay. And I think right in here, that's when I saw the, uh, the red SUV. Miss Howard. Right here. Miss Howard. You want to lie to that jury, but John, that's argumentative, and I would have guessed that she's trying to. Now, show us your version. Just tell us what happened from your side before I interrupt. I'm sorry to interrupt. Show us your version of when you saw Matthew Luther and that police shooting that said. Show it to us. Uh, come on. He was coming out of River's Edge. That's River's Edge right here. Show us how many people come out He was coming Edge. out, turning right uh -huh. onto Sycamore. Okay. Okay, and when I saw him, I told him to stop. Mm -hmm. That's when I turned in right here. Okay. So the second drive. Right here. They don't even pull his hole back. 
I was trying to turn around and get in behind him. I think that's what it stopped it right here. How, 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 how did you turn around? And you said you were coming down there to the second How did you turn around? You see this Sigma Drive right here? Yeah, I see that. Okay, that's the road. That's the driveway right here, too. Okay. I was trying to turn to the driveway and, and back up and get in behind y'all. I think it would be helpful if I showed you another picture. Okay. Because you can see the Do you recognize what you see in the defendant exhibit 13, sir? Yeah, I see it. Is it a, is it a fair and accurate presentation of what you saw that day? From what I'm seeing here, um, if that's the way it was said when they, when they got there, yeah, but I just didn't recall that picture on how it was. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, young, I would like to send the evidence defendant exhibit 13, sir. According to this, it's in the driveway of Cascade. Okay, Cascade, exactly. That's right. you pulled us over in Cascade, didn't you? Uh, when I saw y'all coming out of there, y'all was on putting on to Sycamore. Okay. From what I saw. Did you pull us over in Cascade? This picture say Cascade. Okay, is your police car parked right there on Right the there in the driveway, yes. Well, how did it get there without you? I guess that's where it stopped it. Pulled in it right there okay. and stopped. 
Okay, but so from what I remember that day, what I thought is when y'all came up, y'all was coming up Sycamore, and I turned in behind y'all, but that's where it's at right there. Okay, now, Mr. Howard, isn't it true that when you first saw her, you were coming out of Cascade Apartment? Now, I would mm -hmm. thankfully object to that question because it indicated when you first saw us, I think you said particularly you saw Matthew, you might have served whether anybody else was in the car at that time. Fine. I guess what he calls now. Fine. Now, when you saw Matthew Hood in a red SUV, sir, isn't it true that your car was parked in the office? You were coming out, we were coming like this. Back then, we were coming like that. In the opposite direction. Yeah, we were coming out the direction. I'm on Sycamore. Uh, I'm asking you, you telling us your car was not parked. I mean, you was coming out of Cascade, and we were coming through like this. Look at me. Could you please get the lights on? Let me get it right there. I'll get it right there. Mr. Mr. Howard, do you recall? You were coming out of Cascade like this. And we were coming across dressed like that. Do you recall that when you, when you first saw that? No, no. So you mean no. to tell you didn't do that? No. You see where the car was? I'm on Sycamore. And I saw you all coming out of River's Edge. Okay. Now, when you saw her coming out of uh, 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 River's Edge, you were coming straight out of Cascade. We were face to face, what was it? Uh huh. Uh huh. The way that picture, I'm, I'm coming out of Sycamore. Okay. Well, how did you turn your car around? You said you turned your car around. If you behind us, look at me now. If we coming out, if we come out of the today, if we going right here, right here to Cascade, if you behind her, you wouldn't have had to turn your car around. You just could have got right behind her, Mr. Howe. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't have had no reason to put your car reverse and turn around if you come in right behind her, Mr. Howe. From what I remember, no. Mm -hmm. That's not how it was. Well. Mr. Howard, and during your interview with Rebecca Shaw, isn't it true that you told her you, you put your car in reverse? During that recording interview, you put your car in reverse and you turned around. When I turned around, yes, when I saw you all coming this way, I'm going this way, I turned, trying to get my car in reverse, yes, to get in straight in behind you all. Why would you put your car in reverse if you come right behind us? No, no, no. You, 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 you don't follow me. You going one way. I'm going another way. It's almost like I'm making a new turn. Okay, but I had to put into the driveway. Is there a way to demonstrate to us? Can he demonstrate? I hear hey, what he's been doing it because I don't believe he can demonstrate. Well, can I draw? Can I do a little drawing for you? Okay, I see you're to make that work out. I ain't the best drawing though, Mr. Howard, but I'm going to try to get it so you can understand.